Okay, so we shall begin. Welcome everyone to uh, lecture five. Tonight we'll be talking about how we can containerize applications and a little bit about the beginning of, of DevOps. So how we actually bring our applications into the cloud so that all of our clients can access it versus just being uh, run on our own computers. So just to recap on what we did last time, uh, we talked about ORM, so object relational mappings. These allow us to think of interacting with the database via objects versus manipulating columns and rows. Uh, we create this the relationship of a class is essentially a table. So in your assignment, when you made a student ta a user table or a uh, class table, assignment table, each class you're defining was creating a new table in, a di in the database. Uh, we allowed to we were allowed to define columns and define these references with just regular variables in the class uh, using SQL Alchemy. And a lot of the use of ORM made it easier for us to do simple things like query on our tables and insert into them and establish these references for us. And it also, in the case of the many-to-many, -many, automatically created uh, like the join the like managing of the join table for us. So when you had like tasks, oh no, not tasks. When you had uh, students classes and assignment classes and students, if you added a student to a class, you didn't have to manually go into the join table and add that student's ID and the class ID in there, it handled everything for you along with querying on both. So ORMs make our jobs a lot easier as developers. So hopefully you enjoy the assignment. But yeah. So the big question for tonight is how do we run apps on other machines and how do we run multiple apps on our machine as well? So getting into that question, we'll talk about like environments. So, so far we've been using virtual env to isolate development environments for us. So this allows us to easily have like separate dependencies for projects. So in our case, we want like our Python installation for other projects not to really matter when working on projects for this class along with packages. So if you're familiar, like we are just working with virtual env, we'd make a new environment, we'd activate it and then download our requirements.txt. And that allowed us to create like these easy separations. Uh, the virtual env is very helpful with making sure that like things don't come up in the future if you ever work on many apps at the same time like dependencies will clash and then things will just get messy for you. But um, they're also nice for easy handoffs. So I can just give you some source code and say, here's the installations with requirements.txt and you all have no problem, hopefully um, getting everything together on your machines and avoiding package conflicts. So yeah, this is some of the reasons why we use a virtual env. So for example, we have two projects A and B, but they both want to use the request package. Uh, for some reason, project A wants to use an older version for some reason, but version B wants to use the most current one. But solving this problem of how do we use different packages on the two projects, that's uh, kind of what virtual environments help us solve. So a practical approach for what we've been doing is say you like install your uh, Python 3, then you can pip install all of these requirements through the text file, and then run your application.py. And this works fine for simple applications, but as you can feel, like this is kind of heavily dependent on what machine you all are using. And also, it's quite manual. You have to do the same thing over and over again. And so there's a way we can probably make this better, especially once we get bigger and bigger things going. So like for larger applications, we may include things like a database. We've been doing OK with like SQLite. But for other applications, we may want to use like different systems that require their own separate package installation. Uh, we also want, may add like many, many more requirements. So application like requirements.txts have like no reason why they can't get like in the multiples of do dozens, even approaching 100, like there are lots of packages you could ever want to use for a, uh, for a given application. And uh, it becomes difficult when we have so many things going on to keep everything isolated and clean while we develop. So the setup becomes cumbersome. We have a lot of different things to keep track of. And so we want a more automated and a modular solution to handle this for us. So our approach with, in the name of uh, modulation and automation, in the olden days, not that long ago actually, was uh, this thing called virtualization. So essentially what virtualizing was, uh, was using what are called virtual machines. A virtual machine is just like simulating a computer running on your own computer. So in the case of uh, like for Windows people right now, you will actually have to create a virtual machine of a Linux distribution to use Docker because Docker doesn't work well with Windows for some reason. But uh, virtual machines allow us to like set up an, a totally separate operating system to run uh, in parallel to our normal computer. So because it's its own deal at Sandbox, it's separated completely from all of our other host files and it can operate as its own separate entity. And uh, by using virtual machines, we can actually run multiple at the same time. And this allows us uh, like an easy way to for sure separate like everything possible 
from simultaneously running virtual machines on uh, the same computer. So in the case of running multiple VMs at the same time, servers use this thing called a hypervisor. It's just a name, you don't need to know much about it, but that's like the thing that manages these separate uh, virtual machines. It's like a little graphic to go over how you would run multiple applications with virtualization. As you can see on the bottom level, we have infrastructure. So this, this is just your computer's integrated hardware. So it's everything that's running normally and uh, it's like part of the regular computer. And then the hypervisor is what manages these separate applications. So each application, as you can see, has its own virtual machine encompassing the application itself along with the guest operating system of choice. So for some reason, if you ever wanted to, you could run say Linux with app A, uh, you could run like Windows with app B, and then Mac OS with app C if you really wanted to, if there's reasons you may need to. Not great practice though, but some obvious ways that this is not ideal is that of course you have to run a whole operating system for each application when using virtualization and that adds a lot more code than you actually need to create this uh, virtual vir virtual application environment so ways that we want to improve this is limit the amount of space required to pull off uh, multiple applications and simplify like this will help us improve the speed at which we can launch and run applications as well as increase the number we can have on one machine at a given time so the next evolution of this separation of environments is called containerization. So we do this using Docker. It's a widely used tool. Uh, a, com a competitor to Docker is something developed by Google right now. It's called Kubernetes. Uh, we do our course in Docker though, so it's a simple and easy way to get familiar with containerizing and uh, standardizing these applications. So when we say containerizing, we really just mean like neatly packaging our software into a neat little bundle. It's like a way to standardize each unit of, uh, of software so like we can create contained applications that can be run easily. So the process of using Docker is building code into what are called images. An image is just a set of instructions on how to basically set up your environment as we'll see in the future. And then uh, once we have an image, like directions on how to set up this environment, we run them as a container. So a container is what's actually running the application and it takes the instructions provided by the image to actually instantiate and run all of our code for us. So to talk about the images, so we build these from source code, and as I said, they serve as like a setup for how to actually run our code. So this is analogous to install virtual env, run like source venv bin activate, and set up all that stuff, and then you can finally run Python app.py. So that's all defined in what's called a Docker file, and we uh, once we have a Docker file, we can run this command called Docker build. Uh, the dot indicates just build this current directory. And what Docker will then do is look for the Docker file in this directory and build our application image according to the instructions provided. So once we have images, we can then get into how do we actually run them with containers. So a container is a live instance of this application and we define the running instructions with additional flags when we actually call it. So in this example, doc, Docker run PA4. PA4 is a tag for an image that we would have defined earlier, but as we'll see in the demo, we'd want to add additional flags to say run in the background so it doesn't blow up your console and then to quit it, you actually have to like terminate the entire tab. Or you can run uh, port mappings on it, as we'll see. So say we want to map a specific port on our machine from requests into a different port that's going into uh, the, virtual, uh, the Docker container that's running the application. So there are many other flags. We'll go through some others on the documentation to decide how we actually want to run these containers. So a useful framework for thinking about images and containers is like some analogies here. So like classes are to objects, blueprints, houses, recipes, cakes. It's all about instructions versus productions of these instructions. I guess, are there any questions so far about images, containers, as like they work in our theoretical header? All right, so a graphic we can use to like think about this easier is we have the same like with the same analogy, uh, like the infrastructure of our hardware on our computer, and then we have our own operating system, so Mac OS, Windows, Linux, and then Docker runs on top of that. And Docker allows us to put application containers directly on top of it, so that it's much. I'll, the graphic kind of shows it's not really to scale, but the applications actually are a lot smaller than what we had before. So before, for each application, we had a virtual environment, a host operating system and the application itself, but now for each app we want to run, we only really have these tiny containers 
and allows us to fit more within our allotted computer space and also allows us to run these faster. So here are some of the few benefits, well, many benefits, but yeah, the biggest one in my opinion is like the simplif simplification modularity. It makes, things, uh, makes our lives a lot easier to work with containers versus virtual environments by limiting the amount of, by surely like limiting the amount of code that's involved in each application, we get rid of like a lot of degrees of freedom and we can think cle uh, clearer about what's actually happening in each container. Uh, and of course you can boot applications faster, requires fewer memory resources, and it's just an overall better application management system. So this containerization gets into like the forefront of DevOps. So DevOps is all about shipping software fast. So to split into its parts, DevOps, uh, dev development, is all about building software. So this is what we've been doing the whole time. It's planning to use Python for our application, use SQLite, choose some packages, then actually write all the code and construct our tables and our database model, and then uh, get to like writing test cases and testing that are, uh, are we're fitting API spec. So that's all on like the development side. On the operation side, operations engineers think more about like how we test and release software and how we maintain and monitor that it's working properly in the cloud. Once it's out there, that we have to make sure that things crash. If they do crash, we're there to fix it when they happen. But uh, DevOps is really the boundary where these two meet, like the intersection of the two. And DevOps is a relatively like recent push in the developer community to have more communication between these two uh, originally separate teams, and by Focusing on like the DevOps side, and, like the intersection of these two, the goal is like to build and ship, uh, build and ship software really fast and make sure that it's clean and that it's reliable. It's all about making these operations flow seamless. So as we said before, some of the problems we've had with setting up our environments and other things is like we can automate it. So by making these routines seamless, we can totally automate the DevOps process, or like a large portion of it, and have things like I write code, I save it, and then if you're using like Git or something and you merge it into uh, like a stable, like this is code I want to push, then things can automatically happen such that we take that code, we automatically test it, we automatically approve it, and then automatically push it up to the cloud, and then all of the applications that are referencing our servers are working with the new code base. So we can automate this entire workflow, so that's a big reason why we can make this part seamless, and it's very helpful for uh, developers. So here's like a little graphic I pulled off the internet. Uh, so the left side dev, we can talk about like planning, creating, verifying, and packaging. So planning is like choosing Python, choosing SQL, thinking about how we want to build our apps, creating is like laying down the lines of code, like verifying would be like testing as we've been doing. And what Docker does in the containerization part of it is really all about packaging the code so that once we have it neat and orderly, then we can move on to releasing it and putting it up in the cloud, which we'll be doing next lecture. So then after you release it, you can configure and monitor, and this is like all of the operation side of uh, running an application. So this is kind of like how the two work together, and it's a continuous cycle. So you continually improve and iterate on your code as well as your development procedures, and the two work intertwined like this. Is there any questions about DevOps? Some things I talked about, Docker in particular. Cool, happy, happy. All right. So now we can get into the demo and like, what does this actually look like? Uh, short lecture today, but we will be continuing off of last demo. So with our same to-do app. And so let's see, so let me just get my thing popped up. That's really small. How do I make you bigger? Oh, that's not looking great. All right, let's see. So we have the same. Is this large enough for people? Cool. All right, so we have our app.py, db.py that we were working with last time. So we have tasks, subtasks, and categories. And so the first thing that we want to do, and db file, the first thing we want to do is uh, set up our Docker file. So this will help us determine how we want to build our images. So we can create a new file. So the structure, I want to go over like the structure of a Docker file. And the first thing we want to do is actually utilize something that Docker provides for us, which is previously, um, previous, previously existing images. So this one, from Python 3.7, is already an image that Docker provides for us. And it set up, sets up an entire Python environment. So we can use 
the Python commands and pip packages. So actually, let's first go. Yeah, so that's here. So you can find all of this on uh, Docker Hub. Docker Hub is analogous to GitHub in that it's just a place to store and work with Docker images. So this place right here I got by just Googling Docker Hub Python, and it can show us all of the possible Python uh, images that we can like be, like extend for our own purposes. So as you can see, there are many, oh, I guess Python 3.8 is out, but um, many installations, like they have their, if you read more about them, uh, some will be like, oh, we're trying to like Slim Buster, Alpine's another popular one. And these all have like their own sub optimizations to try to either like go faster or add extension like functionality to what Python can already do or just make it faster. Uh, so, and these, uh, they have, Docker Hub has pre-built images for us on like many other languages, even full OSs. So there's one for like Ubuntu if you're running Linux, uh, probably some for like other languages as well. But for us, we'll be subclassing off the Python one for our purposes. So this from keyword indicates that we're going to be building our image from a pre-existing one off Docker Hub and it knows to look for Python version 3.7. The next thing we wanna do is this image currently will be empty if we were to build into a, uh, run it into a container. So we wanna copy all of our files in our current directory into the container that we will eventually build. So, all, uh, so mainly just like bring in our app.py file, bring in our db file, and then by bringing those in and a requirements.txt, we're able to actually make this container our own code. Next thing we wanna do is run our uh, installation. So running pip install dash r requirements txt. So after the Docker image, when it's building, finds the Python installation and copies all of our files over, it'll then run the, all commands that we say after run. So we want to install our requirements just like we did before with virtual environments. And then the final thing we want to indicate right now is a command. So the command is not actually run upon building the image, but it's only run once we instantiate the container. So for us, that'll be running a Python app.py. So this means after we build our image and we actually want to run it as a container, it will automatically run the Python app.py command for us and get our application running. So some notes about this, uh, for the copy command, the dot, the first argument is like our directory and the second one is the directory we want it to represent inside the container. Uh, right now, if we were to have like a virtual environment uh, with our already installed packages, or right now we have like the PyCache, it'll also include all of those and those folders can get very large. So another thing that we wanna create is what's called a Docker ignore. So if any of you are familiar with the git ignore file, which tells you files to ignore when working with git, a docker ignore is like pretty much analogous, it allows us to just say, hey, when you're building stuff, don't worry about PyCache, and also don't worry about the vent directory. So that way it ignores these massive files that we don't need to copy into our container, so it's a faster process for us. So then after we have this Docker file, uh, we can go ahead and build it as we Talked about in lecture with a simple Docker build. So, where is this? So we can just do Docker, actually, yeah. So Docker build, and we just want to build in this current directory. So as you can see in these steps, it's defining, it's going line by line through the things we defined. So, oh yeah, some questions, yeah. Yeah, I was just wondering, is the copy command recursive? Yes. Uh, no type, they just straight Docker file, no dot anything. Okay. So it's just like a raw character field, character file. Yeah, question in the back. So do they need to have Python 3.7 work? So it stops from Python 3.7? The from 3.7, uh, Python 3.7, so my computer doesn't have to have Python for this to work. The from Python 3.7 will tell Docker when building to automatically well, if I have Python, it'll probably use that, which is why it's like really fast for us right now. But if I didn't, it would first fetch the 3.7 image from Docker Hub, and then it would use that to create the rest of the image for us. Yeah, so as you can see for each step, it's going like from uh, 3.7. And as you can see, this arrow pointing to this hash, 
indicates that it download, oh, it made an image for us actually. So we'll see when we look at the images that this hash should show up as an, act, uh, as an image that we can use. Then copying everything over, some other commands, and then uh, run pip install so you can see it's collecting all the files that we need. And then command python op.py, everything is all good. So now if you look at Docker images, we can see created about a minute ago. This is about one gigabyte and we have our image ID right here. So let's, uh, here's some other Docker images I have from other stuff. But uh, one thing to notice is this tag field is actually useful. So right now we have it as none because we didn't indicate anything, but as you can see, some other ones I've used before make it easier for us to keep track of what's going on other than just remembering image hashes or remembering when we created it. So we actually can build by uh, using a tag. So we can do that by doing docker build dash t, let's call this demo, and then we can build in this current directory as well. So one thing to note about doing this build is that it was much quicker. So Docker will automatically cache any installations or other like manipulation to files within the container that you will create automatically for you. So we didn't have to reinstall all of our requirements. It just used the cache for us. So now if we go back to Docker images, we can see that we created demo and here's our image ID. <clears throat> cool. So the next thing that we can do is say we want to run this for us. So we can just run an image by docker run demo. If we didn't have the demo before, we would have had to copy over this image ID, image ID and put it in here. But we don't have to worry about that because we made our life easier by doing docker run demo. Uh, so I guess I'll just demo why we want to add some additional flags to this. So if we were to run this right now, as you can see, it jumps right into printing everything for us. But we can't actually leave this screen anymore, which is a problem. So if we wanted to use our terminal for something else, we'd have to create like a new window, which is fine, but we can actually uh, make our lives easier by not having it this way. Another problem is that before we could do control C when running our application and it would quit it for us. Now this uh, no longer works. So to actually terminate this from a, to terminate and like get this to stop, we have to terminate the entire window. Oh, one second, I goofed. All right, cool. So we can actually see with Docker PS if we have any containers running. Oh, it looks like I have two left over. So this is the container that we just initiated, but we couldn't stop. And this is one I was testing with earlier today. But uh, we can kill these images, kill these containers by doing Docker kill. Let's go to this one. And it returns us the uh, container ID after we've killed it. So we can do PS again to see if things are back up and going. And we can see it's one less. And let's also now just kill this as before. So a better way we can run these images is by using the dash IT flag. And what dash IT stands for is uh, interactive. So not only will this print everything that's happening in the container to our console, but it'll also allow us to easily stop it by running a control C. And as you can see, once we control C it out, it killed the container for us. Another neat thing we can do is, uh, actually if we kept that running and logged into Postman, nothing would have worked properly with our requests. And the reason for that is that the container, like when working with Postman and sending a request at our own local host, it would have hit our computer's like process running on 5,000, but that's actually different than the process running in the container's 5,000. And it separates the two, which is what we want with the separated application environment. But to have it so our computer automatically reroutes requests for us, we can do this thing called docker run and then use the dash p flag. And here we'll pass in a port mapping for us. So we want to map our ports 5000 into the containers port 5000. And this will redirect all requests from our computer into their computer on that appropriate port for us. So before we can do like dash it and we can run our demo. All right, so now if we go into Postman, 
All right, so let's see if we want to get all of our tasks going. So right now we got a, re a return response, which is great. Uh, let's go back to here and we see that it properly happened inside our container. So it went through our tables, did some SQL for us and gave us back everything. We can test other stuff. See if posting works, looks good. And there it is. Cool, so by containerizing the stuff, we've really like changed like not much in terms of, we haven't changed anything actually in how the code actually runs. The API spec, the, data, uh, the setup of the tables, querying anything. All we've done is just separated this nice environment for us to run our application on. So things are nice and neat. Yeah, and as before, we can control C to get out and see that nothing is running on a computer right now. So the next thing we might want to do with this, another automation tool we can use is called Docker Compose. So Docker Compose should have installed with your Docker installation. So I have it right here. Uh, you can check right now if you have it. And if you don't have it, you should make sure to install it. Um, oh, also a note on installation. Uh, I made a Piazza post last night about it. If you haven't installed Docker, you should do it because you'll need it for this week's assignment. Also, if you have a Windows computer, Windows and Docker do not work well together. So you'll need to make a uh, install a of a software called VirtualBox and run a Linux VM inside your computer and then download Docker within that VM to use it. But um, with installing Docker, you can also use a thing called Homebrew. So let's see. So Homebrew is a, like a package installation manager, just how like py Python has pip, your whole computer can use brew. Uh, and it's an easy way, so you could just do something like brew install Docker and everything should work properly for you. And I included on the Piazza post installation direct directions for brew. You just copy and paste this one command into your console. But um, back to the demo. So Docker Compose. So as we saw with our previous run command, uh, as we want to add more flags onto a run command, it can get quite long and there's a lot of things we want to keep track of. So we can actually run our Docker containers in a more uh, well-defined way. So we do that with Docker Compose. So what we want to do is create a, it's called Docker Compose YAML file. Oh. Oh. Let me name it. There we go. Uh, the dot YAML, for those of you who aren't familiar, familiar with YAML, it's just, it's like, it's honestly, it doesn't change much with the text, but it just gives instructions for software that wants to use like a YAML format. It just defines how to like work, how to specifically define these files to give more structure. So we'll see that as we write our, write our code. But the first thing we need to do is identify the version of Docker Compose we want to use. Uh, we'll use three, it's the latest distribution. And then we actually want to define our services. So an example of a service is an application. So for us, we have a demo, but in the case for other applications, you may want multiple services, multiple containers running at the same time. And Docker Compose, the main power with it is it allows you to do that easily. So for us, we can call our first service demo. And what we want to do from demo is take, not from, we want to define the image we want it to reference. So for us, that will be the demo image. And then we can define things like the ports. That's one thing we want to do. Uh, so for us, that'll be 5,000 to 5,000. And for now, I think that'll be good for our purposes. Other things you can do with Docker Compose files, if you don't have an image uh, or you want to, like just, you can just build from the Docker Compose command and I can just indicate a build directory is right here. So what this would do, if I didn't have this, here before is that uh, when running the Docker Compose command, it would build a new container for a new image for me and then run that image according to the criteria defined in ports and other things. You can also define like a command. So this will override the command field defined in the Docker file for the image. So if right now we have Python app.py, but if I wanted to change something different, maybe like Python app.py and then like some other variables associated with it, uh, like maybe some environment stuff, like specific like shared secrets or things like that, then it could do that with the override command. 
but for us right now we will stick here and then we have our docker compose yaml file back here and we can instantiate our container by doing docker compose up and then just like before uh, without any additional flags this will occupy our window and we won't be able to kill it easily so we want to do this thing called dash d dash d stands for detached and it allows us it just runs the container in the background for us so that we can see that it's working with docker ps and it, we can still use the same terminal window so for us oh that's annoying it's using uh oh. So this SRC demo one is something that was already created when I was testing this earlier, but basically like the inner workings of Compose is it does some extra special sauce to create new images based off of our provided image in uh, right here. So that's why it's different than the actual ID we, uh, the image ID we provided, but it handles all this automatically so we don't have to worry about it. But now we can see if this is running properly by PS. Uh, we can see that it's running the demo image for us and we have our container ID here, and it also indicates that the port is mapping properly. So the local host 0 .0 .0 5, uh, 5000 is mapping to our R5000. So now if we go back to Postman, 5000 tasks, everything is working properly. Yeah. Yeah, question. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so a Docker file is to define how to build the image. The Docker compose is how to run the containers. Gives us that fluidity. Other things you can do with Docker, comp uh, Docker compose, like I mentioned before, is we can have multiple services. So say in the case of a web application, you would have like a back end and a front end. So back end would be like, say we could write in Python, but like a front end we could write with like something like React and JavaScript. So we could define another service, des uh, design another image, some front end, and then a lot similar fields like ports, like say we wanted it to be on 3000. We could do all of that the same way we did with the back end. So uh, we can also point say to like a, a database. So right now we're using SQLite. Another popular distribution would be like, um, Postgres, so we could point our Docker Compose to the Postgres image, and this is actually another one of those defaults that Docker Hub provides us, and it would take that Postgres image and it would run Postgres database in a container for us, and we could add other things like, uh, let's see, depends on, let's see, we could say like, depends on, and we could say database. And we can add additional flags like this that tell Docker Compose to uh, create dependencies between these containers and that a back, our backend requires the database to work properly. So if say something goes wrong with database, it can alert us and also know like why backend may be crashing too and give us that alert. But for our purposes right now, I'll leave this up here. Um, we just need to define a single, single application that we want to run at once. And so we can do that with demo and everything else we got going on. I guess, any questions about Docker Compose and running Docker containers for now? Cool. All right, so for now, this is good for our purposes. I wanna show you one other cool thing where we can actually like go inside the container as it's running and see what's going on. And we do that through something called Docker exec. So exec stands for like execute and we want to Oh, what was the flag? All right, let's see if I can remember this properly. But we can indicate demo, and we want to go into it as a bash. All right, cool. Uh, let me find the documentation. So Docker's documentation allows us, so here's like the detached D that we are talking about before. Things we can also do is de uh, define environments. So say we have some secret API key for like another microservice that we want to use in our backend application. So say like in the case of like eatery, for example, we use Yelp's API for populating our college town eateries and we have an according uh, API key that allows us to work with their API. So we don't want to publicize that on the internet because the point of the key is only you have it. 
And so we could use an environment variable called like Yelp API key and uh, define that within the, uh, in the container so that our code knows it and can use it when trying to access that API. The interactive, let's see, for us we want uh, Zach. Oh, boom. Where are we? Oh, here we go. Oh, I did it right. Oh, I didn't. I did the image, not the container. So for us, we want this container ID, and we can do Docker, exec, it, container ID, and then bash. Cool. So this command prop down here tells us that we're officially in there. Uh, some other things. The hashtag indicates that we're what's called a uh, pseudo user, or so we have like full administration access over everything. Some previous, like if you've ever SSH SSH'd into an external server, you'd see like a cache symbol here. That indicates that you're not the root user and you can't decide everything and you have to override a bunch of commands. But for us, if we ls, oh, uh, I should have done another thing. All right, so this is a bit messy right now. So when Docker builds our images for us, it has a bunch of other stuff that it needs to do with it. So as you can see, it has all these other folders, but in here, it's still copied in our requirements.txt. So say we want a cat, uh, just look at that and we can see it's all the same things we defined. So you can see that everything got properly uh, copied over. Say we wanted to like run our app, it would say, oh no, gives us this error, but this is actually supposed to happen because the Docker container is already running Python app.py for us, port 5000 inside the container, container is already in use. So if some of you have seen this error before working on assignments, uh, this error indicates that you're trying to run the app on a port that's already occupied with another process. So it's good to get this feedback that it's actually running everything properly. So actually we'll go through on how we can make this prettier. Uh, so I think we can exit, cool. So let's go back into our Docker file and we can define something called the work directory. So workdir indicates, I right know we wanna make dir first. Yeah, make dir. So we wanna make something called a user, let's do app, src. So within that user directory that uh, it'll automatically create for us, we wanna create an app and src folder for it. And that's where it'll copy all of our code. And to set it as our main directory, we can do workdir user app src. Yeah. So that way when we run, by setting our work directory as this, when we copy everything over, it'll copy all of our current directory into this new work directory that we defined. Oh, that's not good. Oh, geez. Okay. We'll see if we can survive. But uh, let's see if this works properly by rebuilding. So we can do docker build, tag it as demo, and let's build this current directory. All right, I guess this actually should be run. Like there. Yeah. Cool. Uh-oh, oh. oh. Mm -hmm. Uno momento. For us right now, let's see if we can just make an app directory. And get rid of this. Yeah. Will beans. All right, as you can see, because we uh, changed the Docker file, it's not gonna cache our previous image that we use, so that's why it has to reinstall all these packages for us. So whenever you change the Docker file, it will not use the previous cache that you had before, which is unfortunate, but it's still okay because we have a light app. So now, as you can see, it tagged it as uh, the demo latest for us. So boom, you can see it's right there. And now we can do Docker compose up and detach. Actually before that though, 
we need to take down this existing uh, thing because we can only run one port at a time for us as well. So we can need, we can get rid of this uh, container by doing docker compose down. So this is like a graceful way. Uh, this is better than doing docker kill and then pasting the container ID as we were doing before. This is like a graceful shutdown. So when possible, try using docker compose down. And now we can go bring it back up with our new image. All right, so now if we go in here, we should have, oh. so as uh, as you can see, it put us in user app as we wanted it to with uh, defining the work directory. And now when we copied everything over, things are much cleaner. Oh, this shouldn't be here. Um, not sure why this happened. Docker ignore usually works. Uh, I must have done something wrong and I'll look back at this later. But as you can see, this is a much easier way of working uh, than just pasting everything into the root directory because we have all those e uh, extra folders that I created for us that we don't necessarily want to see. If we like go back out two levels, we can see that they're all still there. So everything is working properly for us. Yes. So that's what we got for Docker today. Uh, next lecture, we'll be talking about how we take these containerized applications and actually put them on a real server. We uh, sent in a request today with Google Cloud to get you all credit. So for the hack challenge and for this coming week, you'll be able to actually take your CMS app and throw it up in the cloud and hit it with a server of requests like from Postman or something to see it's actually working properly. So that'll be really exciting, but this is like part one of a two-part series. But that's all we have for tonight. Uh, I guess we can go over the assignment. So, oh, it's like, I didn't show you one thing. So the assignment is actually going to build a container of your CMS application and then put it up on Docker Hub for us. So, and then you'll just provide a Docker Hub link in the readme file. And uh, so we'll go over how we actually push things to Docker Hub. So the first thing you need to do is use this thing called Docker login. If you don't already have a Docker Hub account, you need to do that first on their website, but I already do. so. And I've already logged in before, so it authenticated fine with me. But uh, what we want to do is, you know, let's go to my Docker Hub, actually. Yeah. All right, so this is my Docker Hub right now. So I have the demo I was testing on before. Why don't you go? So we can go into the settings here and let me just delete this first. So we have a fresh start. But yeah, so my username is C Swanberg. So Docker, to push our images to Docker Hub, we use a command called Docker push. And what we, uh, why we can't just push like our demo because as you can imagine, everyone uh, could have like, anyone could write an image called demo and Docker Hub is like completely open to anybody and everybody. So there would be a lot of conflicting image names. So how you fix this is just, you have to prepend your username to the, um, to the image that you want to push so that it's like guaranteed to be unique because your username is unique. But for us, we don't actually have an image named C Swenberg slash demo. So we need to uh, rename our existing image. So if we go to images right now, we have demo. So we can do th something called Docker tag. And we'll take in demo, but we want to rename it as C Swenberg slash demo. And as you can see, it was renamed properly for us so that when we push it, it knows that it can actually find this image. And then the next thing we want to make sure we can change is the Docker compose. So we want, because we renamed everything, Docker uh, C Swenberg slash demo. So as before, if we were to actually run this on a server, it would first look in the local directory to see if it had an image named C Swenberg slash demo. It of course would not if we had it on a server, but then the next thing it would do is gather this image from Docker Hub. So that's why like we need these image tags to be unique and it would take that and then run our image accordingly. So for us, actually we need to rebuild.
cool. So now that this image has rebuilt for us, let's go. Uh, we can Docker push this image. And it's going to run its process for us. So this is kind of like the URL it's going to push it to, to, to that repository. And it's compiling all of the, like, it's like sub processes it needs to include in our image because like before we like subclass like the Python one and add our own special sauce and add some other things. So it needs to compile all that together. So now if we actually go over to Docker Hub and refresh, we can see that we have this demo here right now. So anyone can, uh, as long as they don't make this a private repository, uh, can go on Docker Hub and like pull up my name and download demo. So how we'll be setting up the server in the next lecture is actually going into the server and then pulling this directly from there. So having it public allows us to work that for us. So yeah, that's how we push it to Docker Hub. And this is what your first uh, your assignment for this week will be like. Yeah, so this is actually the end. Cool. Anyone have any questions about Docker commands, other things we can try to do with it? Yes. Why do you need to rebuild it? I wanted to rebuild it because I changed the, uh, the Docker Compose file, the YAML, the YAML file, and I wanted the image to have that same YAML file with the change. So the change I made was instead of making image demo, I re-tagged the image name. So I want to call it C Swanberg slash demo. So in that case, would you have needed to do the Docker tag demo and change the name? Because since you're rebuilding it, doesn't that automatically give it a new tag? So when we needed to re-tag it, I could have actually, yeah, I didn't need to tag it. I, I yeah, I could have just rebuilt it and given it a new tag name from the beginning. I forgot they needed to rebuild it though before I tagged it. But yeah, that's a good choice. Yeah. Cool. Also, uh, I highly recommend reading more about Docker's doc, uh, the doc documentation. Like the exec is like a fun thing you can do. There are many other things you can do with it. It gets like really deep. For the purposes of this class, this is all you really need to know how to do. But yeah, and we'll go over more of this on the Hack Challenge when you actually have to put these apps onto the cloud. But for now, we are happy. Cool.